what is life going to be like on this earth after the second coming? That's going to be in about 40 years, in about 2062. What's changing? What's going to happen? Oh, everything is going to change. Better is the end of God's word, Judas, verse 3. Remember, the Bible is given once and for all time by the Holy Spirit through the seven prophets of Asia Minor to the church. And once the Bible from God was given to man, man was under in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God lasted about 250 years until denominationalism came on the scene. And the prince of the power there took over and ruled over this world for the last 1,680 years. Better is the end of God's word, Judas 3, and the restoration of God's word, Revelation 22, 18, and 19. If you understand the prophecies of Revelation, the Bible is completed and it's been poured out upon humanity in about 40 years again. Then we can't add to or take away. And we won't be because we'll be in the kingdom of God. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 9 through 12? We know in part right now, but when we have God's word in our minds and in our hearts. And when we know it better, and when the time is right in about 40 years after God's poured out truth, the restoration of truth on this earth, well, then we will be in the second age of the kingdom. That's the second coming of Christ. That's 40 years from now. We have 40 year warfare, Micah 7, verse 15, according to the days. But coming out of the land of Egypt, will I show unto a marvelous thing. So the hidden manna is going to be poured out upon humanity again in the next 40 years. And then we'll be in the kingdom of God under the rule of the prince of peace. And so it's better to be under the rule of the prince of peace than the prince of the power there. The patient in spirit, the poor in spirit, Matthew 5 verse 13, blessed are the poor in spirit. In other words, they're not believing denominationalism and that men can preach objective truth of God. No, they're now have the objective truth of God, the Bible from God. They've given up Gnosticism of men. They've given up the moral standards of men. So it's better to be in the kingdom, of course, than, of God than it is the kingdom of Satan. It's better to be humble ourselves as little children before God, before Christ, than it is to humble ourselves before the Pope or to humble yourself before some preacher, sit at some preacher's feet, it's better to sit at the feet of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Genesis 3, verses 4 and 5, remember, Satan said, no, you're not going to die. You're not going to go into the spiritual dark ages if you do things your way, if you follow your own moral standards rather than God's. You're not going to die. You're not going to go into the spiritual dark ages. It's not going to hurt you. The lie of Satan. Romans 5, 12 through 21. That he's the man of sin. He that's how he ruled over this world by, by telling us that we could preach object truth of God. We can give the world our own Bibles. We can start our own religions. We can do all of these things. And it's okay. Now God allowed it. He wanted us to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the sense that he wanted us to learn the consequences of sin while he was waiting for the world to be populated with billions to bring back the second age of the kingdom, the second coming of the Lord. Back at 2, verse 20, what's going to the kingdom of heaven going to be like? Well, let all the earth keep silent before him. You know, we live in a cancel culture world. Why? Because the prince of power here, he's whispering in everybody's ear, or, or at least demons are, or what the influence, whatever is going on, people believe that they can give to the world their own moral values, and, the, and they feel like, you know, that God's telling them to do that. It's not God. It's, it's Satan. See, denominationalism is a strange fire offered to God. You can't offer to God men's religions. You can't offer to God men's Bibles. You can't preach truth. You, you can't know God's mind, only the spirit understands the will of the Lord. First Corinthians chapter two, verse 11, the Holy Spirit. We've been deceived by the prince of the power of the air. Back to 220, but when the king comes, all the earth is going to be silent. People are going to hush. Leviticus 10, verse three, the Lord will be sanctified. He's going to be glorified. He's going to be the preacher. He's going to be the king of kings. He's going to be the one ruling over this world.
James 3, verse 1, we read, let there not be many teachers. Well, right now, Christian spiritual warfare goes on, and we contend for the faith. There's going to be, we're going to make plenty of mistakes. In fact, that's what denominationalism is about, showing the mistakes of men. That's why the ways of men don't work. We've always had our thumbs on the scales of justice. We always have the scales weighted to our advantage. We always have our own agendas and our own families that we want to take about and our own, our own things we're concerned about. And remember Jeremiah 10, 23, it's not even in man to guide his own path. We can't do it. God created us lacking something that we need from him. That's what it means in Psalms 8, a little lower than God. Lower, we don't have a moral compass. We have to look to God. And so we need God. And that's what God shows us throughout the Bible when we see men's sins. And that's why we've been in denominationalism, show that we need God. First Peter 1, 12, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister the things which are now reported of you. By them which have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost, sent down from heaven. And so it wasn't men preaching the gospel. It was the Holy Ghost through these men. Which things, we're talking about the gospel of the kingdom, not the gospels of men. Which things the prophets desire to look into. So what we're going to have in the second age of the kingdom, the second coming of Christ, is the Bible from God. Some things that the prophets of old always desired to look into. Now, are they still desiring it? No, because in the first age of the kingdom of heaven, they're in that great wedding feast. They're still there in heaven. The kingdom's just been, it's been uh, delayed. And so they still are in heaven. The prophets of old certainly are, are already in heaven and they're waiting the great wedding that's going to happen when this world is burned up. But what's going to happen? This is things that well, the whole Bible is about. That's what the Bible is about and looking forward to is uh, the kingdom of God. When Christ rules over this world for a thousand years. James 2 and verse 8. If you fulfill the royal law. See, that's a Bible from God, not the Bible from me. The royal law, according to the scripture. You shall love your neighbor as yourself, and you do well. So how are we going to know that we are in the kingdom? One of the ways we're going to know is we're going to be loving our neighbors ourselves. Again, we've got 40 years to learn how to do that, to learn how to love our brethren, and learn how to love our neighbors, and learn how to love our enemies as ourselves. When we do that, we know we're under the law of God, the royal law. And that is when we will know that we are Christians. You see, baptized believers in the first century weren't called Christians until they loved their brethren. They were called Christians first in Antioch. What's it going to be like after Christ's second coming? Isaiah 9, verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be on his shoulders. He's going to resume his reign. It's, you know, the founding fathers of our nation had the second coming of Christ in mind, had the idea of the kingdom of God in mind. When they talked about a democratic republic, and that's going to mean that the moral standards are left up to God, and men, men don't decide the moral standards any longer. A democratic republic where the government is upon the shoulders of Christ, morally speaking. Remember Daniel 2, verse 40, for the kingdom of God, the moral standards of God are going to break up and consume all the moral standards of men. The government will be on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor. Okay, in today's world, in the prince of the power there, you have some good counselors, some righteous counselors, and some unrighteous counselors. But all of them are, are believing the lies of the Prince of Power there. That's just the world we live in. They think they can 
they think they can make decisions based upon their moral standards. They think they can decide things for themselves. That's not going to be the case. At least counselors that operate in the kingdom that do not follow the moral principles of God are going to, they're, well, they're not going to be a business very long. And so counselors, instead of prescribing drugs and all kinds of things, they're going to think they're going to love you. If it's, they're Christians, especially, they're going to be loving you well enough to do the very best they can for you. And they're not going to be in it for the money. They're not going to be in it to harm people. They're not going to be in it for ulterior motives. That's going to be gone. It's not because some drug companies paid them to promote their drug. Counselors and doctors and, and all the health care field is going to be completely changed because we're going to have the great physician ruling over this world. Wonderful counselor. The mighty God. You know, we're going to take his yoke upon us, Matthew eleven twenty nine, 29. And his burden, his yoke, and his burden are lighter and easier to bear than the yokes and the burdens of men. Everything we learn from God to follow is for our own benefit. The word of God is like a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our paths. The everlasting Father. And he's talking about Christ here. The, the Father being, you know, we're like chips off the old block. Well, we're children of, of God. He's the father of us, spiritually speaking. He's the king. He's going to rule over us. We're going to do what he says to do. And he's going to take care of us. And then he says, the prince of peace. You know, a lot of preachers want to talk about the peace that passes understanding and have no clue what they're talking about. This peace that we're going to have, and this is going to be in 40 years, means a real peace. The perfect law of liberty, what does that mean? Liberty, freedom from every wind of the doctrine of men. Freedom from men's rule over us, evil men's rule over us. We are going to be in peace for 750 years. The meek will inherit the earth. It's interesting because wicked men want to inherit the earth and they want a bunch of people to die so that the world can last longer for them. That's, that's the idea. But God's plan is the end of a thing is better than the beginning. It's going to be better that the meek inherit the earth than evil men trying to clean up the world for themselves. Prince of peace. There's going to be peace on earth. Peace from men. <laughs> Save yourself from this crooked and untoward generation. Acts 2 verse 40. What does that mean? It means the rule of Christ over this world. You know, this is the third time that our Savior is going to save the world. The first time was the flood. How did the flood save this world? Because men were evil continually, and they were living for 900 years, and the earth could not sustain that. So a flood was brought to this world to save this world. For me, the second, of course, was when Christ came into this earth, the first coming of Christ. Bible was completed, the kingdom of God came, and he ruled over this earth for about 250 years. And until we have, and in the Bible, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, men gave up the truth. That's the Bible. Men gave up the Bible from God. 2 Thessalonians 2, 10. That's in the Bible. This has all been there. God has just given to us a strong delusion. So we wouldn't understand these things. We couldn't know that we were under the prince of the power of the air. You know, it would have scared us all to death. But the Lord is only going to bring his Bible upon this earth, completed fully in the kingdom for 1,000 years. So let's look at Job chapter 31. The end of the Bible and its restoration. There are two different things. The Bible is given once and for all time. It only had to be given once for humanity, but for us, it's being restored. The end of the Bible and its restoration is better than the beginning when men fell away from the objective truth of God in the garden and also when denominationalism began. And Jehovah turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends away from the rule of the prince of the power of the air. He wasn't captive to Satan anymore. 
the Lord kind of disappeared from Job's life for a little while so that Satan could try to rule over him a little bit. His in, influence him more in this context. Satan was alive in this point. And Job gave Job twice as much as he had before. Again, the meek are going to inherit the earth. God was blessing Job exceedingly. And you know, all spiritual blessings in Christ are going to come in the second age of the king. All spiritual blessings from Christ. I think one of the reasons why we've been under the rule of Satan is because for the righteous to still love and obey God, even though we're not receiving the blessings from him, is important to God. Some people have this idea that God is just created man so he'd have somebody to worship. No, for 6,000 years of humanity, God hid his face, his power, his glory, his majesty from man so that we would learn to love him even though he wasn't blessing us. Like we think God ought to bless his creation. I mean, he's always been marching out for us. Even when we were eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was for our benefit. We had to suffer because of sin so we would understand the cost of sin so that we could live with him eternally in heaven. So Job was given twice as much as he had before. A lot of men talk about wealth and prosperity preaching. Well, men can't preach that, but God can. Then came there unto him all his brethren and all his sisters and all they that had been of his acquaintance before and did eat bread with him in his house. And they bemoaned him and comforted him concerning all the evil that Jehovah had brought upon him. Every man also gave him a piece of money and every one a ring of gold. So Jehovah blessed the latter end of Job more than his beginning. And he had 14,000 sheep and 6,000 camels and a thousand yoke of oxen and a thousand she donkeys. He had also seven sons and three daughters. And he called the name of the first Jemimai, meaning the lady of daylight. And the name of the second Kizahai, meaning it is finished. And the name of the third, Karen Hapak, the horn of beauty. And in all the land, there was no women found as fair as the daughters of Job. And the father gave them inheritance among their brethren. It's interesting, isn't it, that Job seems to be treating women better than others would in that day and time. And after this, Job lived 140 years. You know, Job thought he was toast. Job was going through a time when he wasn't blessed by God. God allowed it so that he could see if Job still would follow after God, and Job did. Oh, he made some mistakes, but remember, that's our job. As men, that's men's part in the scheme of redemption, to make our mistakes and show that God is needed. So Job lived 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. Christianity is more than we could have ever imagined it would be. The ways of God are as high as the heavens above the ways of men. Isaiah 55, verse 9. Truth from God is exceeding abundantly above anything we could have ever imagined. Ephesians chapter 3. Verse 20, our world is starting to be turned back right side up right now. And in 40 years time, we're not going to recognize this place. For the last 750 years of humanity on this earth, with God's perfect moral standard, it's going to be the best of men. You see, God's plan is all about letting men do things in six days. One day is to the Lord is a thousand years. Six days, God, he forced men to be mediators between God and man, at least mediating some, doing some things to show that we're going to mess up so that we look forward to Christ ruling over this world. And so what the kingdom of heaven is about is God showing us how he would do things, giving us that missing part of man that we need God's moral standard. And now humanity is going to be what God meant for it to be for 1,000 years. So for us, the last three quarters of the thousand years 
reign of Christ. Thank you for watching us today. We have commentaries, paperbacks, hardbacks, zip drives, EPUBs available. I want to share with you the pearl of great price. The question we should all ask is, what is good and evil? Objective moral truth from God is good, and subjective moral truths and lies from men are evil. Let God be true and every man a liar. For 1,680 years, the Lord has hidden objective truth in the book of Revelation. This has allowed mankind to test out the subjective moral truths of men. We're starting to come out of the spiritual dark ages and are restoring the perfect law of liberty. www.lulu.com slash spotlight slash time of the son of man.